as I said before, and I think that the the industry back in um, you know 2006, at least from my experience, was obviously um, a lot more in Asia at that time. But you had you know a very large number of people who were new to trading coming into the industry, and whilst there are still people who are new to trading, of course there are. You now have a much more mature customer base of people who have been trading for some time, who may you know go 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 away and come back to trading. They may trade do FX trading and then move to equity trading, etc. But I think the demographic now in most of the developed marketplaces is you know much more mature marketplace. Having said that, it's also fair to recognise that you know the pro product penetration is still immature in some marketplaces. When I you know, if you take CFDs, I mean the CFD as a concept, you know equity based CFDs was introduced into Japan in sort of the early 2000s. That product has stopped, still not really taken off, but FX trading in Japan is still incredibly active. Equally, if you look at something like binary options, I mean, binary options has taken off and is very significant in Japan, but has not taken off in, in, the, in the European markets. The same as in Germany, where the warrant trading has been very significant for years, and CFD trading is now sort of beginning to develop. So I think the demographics, if you take the, you know, the, the human demographic, I think we're now seeing a much more sophisticated, much more aware, much more connected, much more communicated to customer base. But on the product level, you still see you know, fundamental differences in, dif in, in different geographies. If you take the UK, it's quite interesting in that you know, CFD trading or spread betting in the UK started as very much an equity activity. People trading you know, single equities, you know, trading British trade paddy so British Telecom or British Petroleum, etc. Whereas now it's become a much more index-based industry, and a lot more of the volumes are on indices rather than on individual equities. And I think some of those trends will, will change because I still think there's still a lot of people who don't understand, you know, the, the power of leverage trading and the, and the benefits of leverage trading, and obviously, you know, the benefits of spread betting, specifically here in the UK, in terms of the tax advantages associated. With Um, I think that, I mean, if you look at, as you say, if you look at spread betting, I mean, the, you know, the FX market is, I think, by, by latest, you know, a five trillion business, of, you know, it's five trillion dollar business. And whilst retail trading is, and, and I hate the word retail, I mean, it's, it's, it's private clients, but I mean, that's what the Fs, you know, the, 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 the regulators sort of determine. It is representing, you know, a significant proportion of the marketplace. But I do not believe it is representing the, you know, the, the, the size and the scale that is beginning to completely distort marketplaces. If you take, and and if you, especially if you look at equities, you look at something like you know, British Petroleum. I mean, you know, BP stock is widely held across a very, very large number of significant financial institutions. And the, the degree of stock, you know, the, the degree of, set of, of, of spread of that organisation amongst investment you know, communities is significant. So, yes, I think that you know, derivatives trading you know, can affect marketplaces. I think it is more the derivatives and OTC trading by the financial institutions that is affecting those marketplaces, rather than the derivatives trading by the private clients. I think that's, I mean, I think that, I think, you're gonna, I think, I think that you've got to be careful with the phrasing of that question. I mean, I mean, but I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at the way that most markets operate, it's matching buyers and sellers. Now, if you look at, if, if you look at, you know, people who are trading on our platform, there are a number of people who believe the dollar is going to strengthen versus the yen or versus the euro, and there's a number of people who think opposite. There are a number of people who think that the Dow Jones has reached its height and it's going to drop back, and therefore they will start selling the Dow. There's a number of people who think it will go further. Our job, what we do, is we match buyers and sellers. So we run, we obviously run a, a, a company where we are matching buyers and sellers. And what we then do is we have a risk appetite. We have an amount of capital that we are prepared to, to put at risk in terms of if there are more buyers and more sellers. And when we get to a certain point, we then actually say, right, we will move some of our risk into the marketplace. So 
equally, if, so if, if you look at our situation, we are matching buyers and sellers. We are looking for opportunities to maximize that. If we have too many buyers versus sellers, we may well go into the marketplace and, and offset that risk. In doing so, we may well lose money or make money, but we're not making a judgment about the market. What we're doing is making a judgment about you know, our client base and how many buyers and sellers match each other off. I think that the, the concept, what we need to do is to provide a trading service to our clients and look at how we risk manage that appropriately. But what's really important is transparency. Because if a client comes onto our system and sees that, well, hold on, I'm, I'm, looking on the, I'm looking on the TV or I'm looking on a Reuters screen or I'm looking on a Bloomberg screen and I can see the dollar, you know, the dollar is trading at 165, but I look on London, Capital, London Capital's website and I see it trading at 162, there's immediately a mistrust in our business model. So I think what's more important is about the transparency, whether a company is managing the risk internally or whether the company is transferring all of that risk to a third party, such as another bank, etc. That's based on their business model, it's based on their capital, and it's based on their ability to, to manage that flow. What's important is to make sure that you have transparency to your clients so that your clients can trust that what you're doing is, is transparent to the market and is giving them best execution and isn't putting them in an adverse position versus the underlying market. I, I think that, and, I, and I, I, I sadly have seen examples, but not, not, in, not in Europe, I might add, of companies where um, you, know, you have an organisation that is a market maker that is also a price maker, and I think that that creates some conflict of interest. I think that under the, especially under the FCA rules at the moment, I mean, we have, you know, if, if someone believes that their stock has been you know, triggered unfairly, then they're at liberty to raise a complaint to us and raise a complaint to the, the, the ombudsman. And you know, we recently had, um, you know, we recently had a customer who came to us and said, "Look, you know, his trip, his his, whisks, um, his his stock was triggered unfairly." And we went back and we checked, and there was, you know, a significant price movement in the marketplace. And that's what happens is that if there is suddenly a major price movement and it moves through someone's stock, there's not much we can do about that now. If that was due to an error in a price feed, i.e. it was just a spike in a price, but there was nothing traded, then we would fairly go back to the customer and say, hey, look, you know, your stock was triggered, but it was through you know, a bad price piece of data or a bad data feed. But when we went back and investigated, it was a real price movement in the marketplace. And I think that's what happens, is that what people do sometimes with, with, stock, with stock positions is, they get the market right, but they become over leveraged. And I think the issue is that if you're trading within sensible leverage limits, if you get the direction of the market right, but there is, in, in, you know, there is a lot of inter a volatility, you won't necessarily suffer from the result of that. But if you've taken a 200 times leverage position and you have a small amount of capital and a significant exposure, then any significant movement in the marketplace you, you will lose that position. And so, yes, over, the, over five hours, you've got the market direction right, but in that two minutes, you were stopped. So I think that people who are concerned about you know, their, their, their stops should, should really look at their leverage policy, because quite often they can get the market right, but, but just put their stops in the wrong place. But I mean, I think that under the FCA regulations of fair execution and transparency, I think I would fairly say that I can't believe that I, well, I know that my company, and I do not believe that any of the well regulated, you know, my rail regulated competitors would enter into that type of activity because they would immediately lose their license and, you know, in certain circumstances, could face personal prosecution. That's, that's one of the benefits of working with a company that is regulated by, you know, the FCA. It has very strict guidelines and very strict principles.